So a lot of you guys know me. Some of you guys have heard me teach. Some of you guys haven't heard me teach. Um, I'm very fun. I like to have fun. Um, I like to have fun because I'm a youth pastor, okay? And as a youth pastor, part of what we do is disciplining and correcting and teaching. And lots of times I feel like you're, you know, you're like that mom sometimes. You're like always like, no, don't do that. Don't, do, don't jump off that. Don't, don't, don't do that. Don't, don't pick up that. St-. You know, you're always doing something. So you always have to be instructing. And as Miss Tabitha can tell you, when we're teaching kids and we're teaching youth, we're teaching them. We're instructing them on the way to go, the way to move forward. And so if you don't do it with some fun, they ain't going to want to come back right? So you got to do it with a little fun. You got to be a little feisty. I found that they always love it if you threaten them a little bit. Um, Really, seriously, kids love it. My kids love it. Like all the time if they do something, I'm like, if you do that again, I'm going to leave you outside to die. We're not coming back for you, but I love you. I found if you say I love you and you just let them know, you can threaten them in any way that you want. And it works out great. Um, I want to say to um, Brother Ralph, you know, about that great message that he gave from the Lord. Was that not good? Amen. But I want to tell you guys um, several of the words that he said in there. You're going to hear again this morning when he said, do not um, hesitate. He said, I think, do not waver. Um, You know, you're going to hear those words in my message today. And I want to tell you something else, too. God is my witness. I was standing here this morning, and we were doing that shout to the Lord. And I was just standing there, and I was praying. And I said, Lord, I want to be faithful. I want to be true. I want to fight the good fight. I want to be, I want to make it to the end of the race. I said, God, make me strong and courageous. And then Brother Ralph said in his message, you are strong and courageous. And if that's not the Lord giving you a little pat on the back, telling you that you've got it good to go, I don't know what is. So I just want to say thank you to Brother Ralph for being obedient. It takes a lot to stand up. It takes a lot to stand up here um, and to teach the word, to speak out in faith what God has given you. Amen? Amen. Okay, so can everybody say amen? Amen. And say that was a good word. word. Say preach it. it. Feel feel free to use those throughout the day today, okay? Um, I teach a little bit different than Pastor Chris does, which is not a right or wrong thing. I'm an expository teacher, as he said. I like to take the word and break it down verse by verse and make it easy for you to get and understand. And we're going to do that today in a good and fun way. Um, But I have a pretty serious message um, that hopefully everybody will still love me by the end. And if you don't, come and we'll talk because we got to make sure you're okay before you leave. All right? So today we're going to talk about compromise. And compromise seems like a good word, right? Compromise has two definitions. And the first one is a really good one. The first part of compromise says it's an agreement or settlement of a dispute that is reached by each side making concessions. So if I want steak and my husband wants chicken and we decide on seafood, we've made a compromise, correct? You know, we (laughs) just go along with it, you know, but we've made a compromise. And in life, those types of compromises, when two people can come together with differences and come to an agreement, that is a great compromise. And that is the good part of life. But it's the second part. The second part to that is where we stumble and where we fall. And the second part of that says that when we accept standards that are lower than desirable. When we accept standards that are lower than desirable. We look around in the world today and we wonder, you know, how many of you guys have heard yourself praying this lately? God, why is this this way? Why is the world this way? Why is all this happening? Why is all this going on? Like, what's happening, God? It's like everything's falling apart. It's in chaos. What's going on? The answer is simple. It's compromise. And you may say, well, you know, well, what do you mean? What do you mean, Ms. Desiree, by compromise? This is how we've compromised. And I also want to tell you guys, too, I don't ever stand and teach my youth or anybody else if God hasn't already corrected me and whipped me and spanked me and got me to where I need to be before I can teach it or speak it. Because you can't speak on something you don't know or you haven't experienced, right? That's right. So when I'm looking at this, you know, God says this is how we've compromised. He says, we've compromised our complete ways of life. He said, we've compromised in the things that we watch on TV. There's, I don't even have regular TV. Um, You know, we subscribe to a few things. But the thing is, there's nothing to watch. There's nothing to watch that doesn't cause some type of compromise. And, And I'm not putting anyone down. I have a standard for myself and my life of things that I will and will not watch or allow into my heart and my mind. And I've even had people be like, just get past that point or just overlook that. But the thing is, if I have to get past it or overlook it, what am I doing? I'm compromising. I'm accepting something that is lower than desirable. 
We've compromised in the things that we listen to, the people that we listen to. We've compromised in our friendships. We've compromised in, in the Word of God. We've compromised in our attendance in church. Um, I mean, look around. You know, there are some churches that are full and overflowing, and I praise God for them, but I hope that there's not compromise there because compromise is not going to get us through those pearly gates, people. Amen? So this is what we've done. We've allowed the enemy. Everybody knows who the enemy is, right? Brother Ralph spoke about the enemy this morning. We've allowed the enemy to work through social media. I don't even hardly get on social media anymore because every time I do, I see something, somebody else is ranting and raving, somebody's doing something, I see something, I'm like, why didn't I get invited to that? I mean, it's just this whole thing. Um, I feel worse after I get off of it than I did before I got on it. So I've taken a huge step back from those things, but it can be a good platform, but the enemy has used it as another area to compromise. We've compromised our thoughts and beliefs. We've allowed the enemy to manipulate us into believing a watered-down version of just about everything, even the Word of God. We believe a watered-down version. We don't, we don't see things happening or things going on in our lives because we're believing a watered-down version of who our God is. And he is strong and mighty. He is strong and courageous. He is the king of the universe. He is still able to do great and mighty things. And that's my whole point about my message today, is I'm here to say that that's wrong. This is my question to you guys today. It was a question that God presented to me. Where is our loyalty? Where is our faith? What is your character saying about you? Where is our integrity? They've all been compromised. And if we don't take those things back, how are we going to make a difference in this world? So that's what I'm going to share with you today. We're going to have a look at what we've compromised, how we let it happen, and what we can do about it. So we're going to turn over to the book of James. You guys can all flip over to James. I love my boy James. I'm on such a James kick lately. I feel like every problem in the world could be solved in James. Just a personal opinion. While you guys are turning there, how many people have ever heard of the comedian Michael Jr.? He's a black comedian. Really, really funny. Um, he does a little skit on James while you're getting there. It's towards the Old Testament. I mean, towards the New Testament. Tw- towards the end if you're struggling to get there. Um, but he talks about this little skit about James, and he says, you know, James was who? He was the younger brother of Jesus, right? So, you know, he says, you know, we see those bracelets with the WWJD. He says, what if it was what would James do? You know, like, James grows up his whole life like, why can't you be more like your brother? Why can't you be more like Jesus? You know, and one of my favorites is, you know, I've talked about this before, but, you know, Jesus goes out, you know, he's walking on the water. James is like, oh, I'm going to try that. James goes out, you know, because he couldn't walk on the water. Did you guys get that? He tried. He, yeah, okay, good. Because you guys are just like deer in the headlight look. Help him, Lord, in the name of Jesus. Okay. So it starts out in James. Very first, James chapter 1 starts out. Verse 1 says, this letter is from James, a slave of God and the Lord Jesus Christ. A slave. I mean, he's the brother of Jesus. He could have wrote, you know, this is a letter from James, the brother of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. I mean, he could have put a little clout in there, right? But what did he say? He said, I am a slave, a servant. He wasn't taking any recognition because he knew all recognition belonged to Jesus. But he says, I am a slave of Jesus Christ. And so it goes on. We're going to start at verse 5, but I like that opening letter because so often, you know, this is one of the things I continually talk to my youth leaders about, you know, um, I'm there to serve them. I'm there to serve my youth. I'm there to serve my leaders. That's what a, or my youth leaders, but that's what a true leader does. We come and we serve. We're not there for recognition. We're not there for clout and titles. We're not there to, you know, I'm this and I'm that because I, I do have a lot of titles. I could stand and say, you know, I'm the associate pastor of the church. You know, I'm, I'm a senior pastor. I pastor the church. I'm a youth pastor. I could name off all these things, but truly I'm just a servant. Just a servant of Jesus Christ. So verse 5 starts here. And again, like I said, James, if you, if you ever wonder where to start reading in the Bible or tell someone to start reading the Bible, James is an amazing book to start in. Because I feel like James just addresses everything that's bad and wrong in the world. You could take what he was addressing at this time and apply it to where we are in life today. And you'd be like, wow, how did James know? But that's where we are. So verse 5 says this. If you need wisdom, who doesn't? Anybody in here got all the wisdom? You got it all figured out? You're good to go? 
says, if you need wisdom, ask our generous God and he will give it to you. I find myself continually praying, God, give me wisdom. Give me wisdom in the words I speak. Give me wisdom in how I respond to people. Give me wisdom in my responses. Give me wisdom not to kill somebody. You know, I'm all the time looking around saying, God, I need wisdom. And it says, he will not rebuke you for asking. Thank, thank you, Lord, that you don't rebuke me for asking because that's what's kept me from killing a lot of people. It's what's kept me from road rage. It's what's kept me from bring, you know, not bringing any youth back harmed you know, safely to their parents. Some of them are only children. Their mom and dad might get a little upset with me. Um, you know, if I didn't bring them back in one piece, no matter what, how good the story was. But he says, he will not rebuke you for asking. It says, but when you ask him, be sure that your faith is in God alone. Your faith's in who? God alone. Can you guys bring up, I've got some cute slides for you today because I feel like it keeps things interesting. Can you guys put up my Kermit slide? This is me. This is me. I want to speak on certain things, but I don't because my mouth is reckless, my chill is on life support, and I am trying to be a better person. That is me every single day. I can't tell you how many times I've got on social media and I'm like, something happens or somebody's done something, somebody's wronged me, somebody wrote something, and I'm like, and I don't even get to the end, and I feel Holy Spirit being like, you're not going to put that out there. You're not going to say that. That is reckless. That is not right. And I'm like, hitting that back button. I'm deleting it. My mouth is reckless. I have to get it under control. My chill is on life support. Anybody else got chill on life support? Every once in a while, you got to give it a little jump, sp- jump start. I says, and I'm trying to be a better person. Every day, I'm praying that I want to be a better person. I don't want to be the person that compromises. I don't want to be the person that leads the youth astray. I don't want to be the person that backs down and doesn't do the right thing because it's the hard thing to do. We have to stand for the right things. But this is how I feel. Just because I haven't put it out there doesn't mean that I don't have an opinion about it, and I'm going to get to that later. But I know how reckless my mouth can be. So it says that if my faith is in anyone, anyone but God alone, even if my faith is in my husband and I have faith in my husband, my faith can only be in God alone. I can't trust anyone else to do what needs to be done. It has to be God alone. It says do not waver. Kind of heard that similar this morning. Do not hesitate. Do not waver. What's another word for waver? Do not compromise. Do not back down. It says, for a person with divided loyalty is as unsettled as a wave of the sea that is blown and tossed by the wind. How many people have ever been on like a floaty? You've gotten on a floaty in a pool? Anybody ever been on a floaty in a pool, right? So you just get on that floaty and you're just like, you're just chilling, right? You could just lay there all day long. The sun's beating down. Every once in a while you splash a little water. But you could just lay there and take a nap. Anybody ever fallen asleep on a, on a floaty in the pool? Right. You ever gotten on a floaty in the ocean? You will die. You will die, you will drown, don't do that. Unless you get way, way out there and it's like a really calm ocean day, but you will, I love the ocean, but you will die. You cannot get on a floaty in the ocean. You're going down. It's it's going to overtake you, you're not going to make it. And that's what he says right here. He says, you'll be as unsettled as a wave of the sea that is blown and tossed by the wind. You ever been out there and you like so want to be on the ocean in a floaty and it's just flipping and flopping and you can't get comfortable and as soon as you lay your head back, a, a wave comes over and slaps you in the face and it goes up your nose and you're drowning and dying. That's what I'm talking about. That's what he's talking about right here. He says, such people should not expect to receive anything from the Lord. What should they expect to receive? Nothing. Nothing. We always, you know, this is the thing. I'm all with Warren on teaching about grace. The grace of God is good. But we also have to remember the grace of God comes when we are following the word of God, when we are living for God. We can't go live hell on wheels all week long and then come back and be like, it's all good. It says we can't receive anything. It says we receive nothing. And I didn't make that up. Those aren't my words. Those are the words of God. He said, don't expect to receive anything from the Lord. He says, if your loyalty is divided, if it's between me and the world, if you're compromising my standards to make it fit into your lifestyle, he said, don't expect to receive anything from me. Seems harsh, doesn't it? But I didn't say it. James said it through the Holy Spirit. He says, if their loyalty, he says, their loyalty is divided between God and the world, Their loyalty is divided between God and the world, and they are unstable in everything that they do. Unstable in everything that they do. You ever come across somebody and you're like, they were a little bit unstable, a little bit scary? Yeah, we've come across those people. You cannot be loyal when it only serves you. I mean, how many times, you know, Pastor Chris has taught it. I've heard other people teach it. But we can't do what we want, and then when something bad comes into our lives, that's the first time we've prayed in a week. 
It, it can't be that, you know, we're not in prayer and communication with God on a regular basis. Our loyalty can't be divided. God's like, I'm not just the 911 that you ring up every time you have an issue or problem. You should be on the phone with me every day, all throughout the day. I'm not your 911 call. Your loyalty cannot be divided. We have to be completely sold out to Jesus Christ. And I've taught that many times. You have to be sold out. You have to be sold out. You have to be sold out. And sold out doesn't equal compromise. There's no compromise in sold out. Sold out means I am all in. There's no compromise. It says that you're unstable. How many of you people have ever... Um, how many, do you guys know those... Um, Hoverboards? Have you seen those little hoverboards that those kids get on? They got two little wheels on them. How many people have ever tried to step onto one of those? Anybody? Okay, so I'm going to tell you a little story. A few years ago, I was on a, in a meeting, and I was at this hotel, and there was some, these are when they first came out, and there's these kids out there in the hallway. There were some teenagers, and they had one. Of course, I can relate to any teenager on the face of the earth. I didn't always feel that way. Teenagers used to intimidate me because, you know, they don't speak unless you learn to speak their language. Um, because you know how teenagers are. You ask them, hey, how are you doing? Good. Oh, okay. Well, what's been going on in your life? Anything new? Nothing. Okay. Um, you know, that's how they are. Unless you really learn who they are and you learn how to speak to them, then you can get stuff out of them. But anyway, I go out into the hall, and they've got this little thing. And so I walk up to them like, hey, what is that? You know, and they're talking to me about it. And I'm like, can I try it? And they're like, yeah, yeah. And so, like, I go to, like, step on it. And, like, it literally takes off, and I, like, almost fall backwards. And I'm like, okay, okay, what am I doing wrong? What, what's happening? You know, and so they're, they're, the, they're three little boys, you know. They're probably about 12, 13 or something. And they're like, okay, they're, t- they're trying to teach me how to get on this thing. So I get on the thing, and I'm like this. They're like, just, just don't move back and forth. And so, like, I finally get steady. And I'm like, okay, how do I make it move? And they're like, lean forward. And I'm like, you just told me not to move back and forth. They're like, don't move back and forth, just lean forward a little bit. And so, like, I'm trying to lean forward, and I'm like, well, they're like, if you want it to go this way, lean over here. If you want it to go this way, lean over here. It was the most unsteady, unstable thing I'd ever been on my life. They're zooming up and down the halls in it. I barely, I almost died right then and there. They almost had to call my husband and be like, your wife was lost in a tragic accident, including a hoverboard today, you know? But it was unsteady. It wasn't sure footing. And that's how we are when our loyalty is divided between the world and the Lord. And so I want you guys to skip down to verse 16. Those other verses in there are really great. Study those on your own. They're just not part of what I'm covering today. Verse 16. I see sweet Leah back there with that little baby. Hi, Leah. I knew, I know Leah. I go to Planet Fitness, and she was there. I never knew that she was related to uh, Brittany's cousin until, like, later on. Isn't it so amazing? And I always think back. I'm like, you know what? I am so good that, you know, I hope Leah could say that I always represented and showed myself well. I always talked to her. I always asked her if she was pregnant. I always checked on her, seen how she was when she's pregnant and all this stuff. Um, and we're going to get to that later. It's about being that better person. But verse 16 says this. If you're there, it's James chapter 1, verse 16. It says, so don't be misled. Don't be deceived. Okay? So obviously we can be, right? James is writing to who here? It says at the very beginning he was writing to the 12 tribes of Israel. He was writing to believers. He says, don't be misled. Meaning we can allow ourselves to be deceived, right? Because we allow compromise to come in. It says in the verse right before that, verse 15 says, that These desires give birth to sinful actions. And when sin is allowed to grow, it gives birth to death. Death. Anybody ever thought about dying? Like, I'm honestly not afraid to die. I mean, like, if it was right then happening, I'm sure I might have a little bit of fear because it's human nature. But, like, I don't have a fear of death. And that only comes if you truly... <laughs> Have faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm not saying I want to die today, but I'm just saying I don't fear it. But I also don't want to be doing anything that's giving birth to it. So it says, do not be misled. It says, whatever is good and perfect is a gift coming down to us from God our Father who created all the lights in the heavens. It's a what? A gift. Were you entitled to it? Did you do something to deserve it? No. It's a gift, right? If, if I, today I brought a gift for, for Courtney because I missed her baby shower because, you know, my husband had the COVID cooties. And I was, I didn't have, I want you all to know, I did not have the COVID cooties. I tested negative. I had nothing. I was, I told, you know, Ron asked me earlier, he said, did you have the COVID? I said, no, I have that blood type that doesn't, that can't get COVID. He was just looked at me and I was like, it's called the blood of Jesus. <laughs> Feel free to use that one. Um, Amen. That's right. But I never got the COVID cooties. My youngest daughter had it, and she kind of lost that taste of, you know, sense of um, um, taste and smell. 
She was eating a pot pie one night. She was like, she's like, I don't think I can do this. It just tastes like warm mush in my mouth. <laughs> I felt so bad for her. She's like, I'm going to go eat cold pizza. <laughs> and, and she did. Um, and I thought a few times I was like going to have to just like jumpstart my husband, but I didn't get the COVID cooties, okay? So he says this. He says, whatever is a good and perfect gift, we are not owed anything. We're not owed anything. We have a whole generation of entitled human beings walking around. And you want to know why they walk around that way? Because the generation before them that worked so hard wanted to make it a little bit easier on them, and now we made them into monsters. But it is a gift. We're not entitled to it. We're not owed to it. God gives it to us because he loves us, because he cares about us, because we, as it says here later, are his prized possession. It says in verse, um, uh, the rest of verse 17, it says, he never changes or casts a shifting shadow. Do you ever think about that? Never changes, never casts a shifting shadow. If he doesn't sh- cast a shifting shadow, it means he's steadfast, right? How many people can we say that about? How many people can we look around in the world today and be like, they are steadfast? There's nothing, you know, there's nothing shifty about them. They are steadfast. They're true. They're the same every single time I see them. They are steadfast. It says that's what our, our God is. It says he chose to give birth to us by giving us his true word. Who is the true word? Jesus Christ. John chapter 1 says, in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. He gave us the true word, and it says, and out of all creation... The rest of John chapter 1 says that he was the author of creation. It says all things were created through him and nothing was created except by through him or through him, by him. Jesus is the one. It says we became his prized possession. And church, that's the thing that we have to remember. You know, Brother Ralph gave that message this morning, but we have to remember that we are God's prized possession. We are very loved. We are very cared about. We are wanted. And we cannot allow compromise to come in and change that. And it can. I've seen many relationships, marriages, friendships, where there's true deep love, but a compromise comes in and it shatters and it breaks everything. It tears it down. And we can't do that. We can't allow that in our lives. Okay? So it goes on, verse 19, he says, Understand this, my brothers and sisters. You must all be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to get angry. It's hard, isn't it? Anybody else? Quick to listen? How many of us will actually want to listen? Like, we hear the first few things that somebody says, and then we've got a solution, we've got an answer, we're ready to fix it for them. But the Bible says that we should be quick to listen and then slow to speak. Sometimes people don't want our our answers and solutions. You know what they want? They want somebody to listen. God wants us to listen. I can't tell you how many times I've sat and talked to the Lord and just rattled off and these issues and problems and things, and God, I just need to fix this, and I want you to do that. And God's like, just listen. And I'll be honest with you, I have a hard time listening. Like, I'm sitting there for a few minutes, I'm like, I don't hear anything yet. Are you going to, you know, like, I mean, like, I really have to get it calmed down. I really do. I have to take time. I have to focus. Quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to get angry. I already admitted to you guys I'm ready to kill people most of the time, right? I mean, I look sweet. My, my, my youngest daughter here, she's two inches taller than me. She acts like she's a giant compared to me. She's always like, yes, I need now. I'm like, I will kill you. And I will leave you for dead in the backyard. And I'll tell everybody you ran away. She just looks at me like, mm-mm. She's like, you're little. Mm-mm, don't ask me. Be slow to anger. It says, human anger does not produce the righteousness that God desires. So get rid of all the filth and evil in your lives. Humbly accept the word that God has planted in your hearts. For it alone has the power to save your soul. Verse 22 says, don't just listen to God's word. Don't just listen to God's word. How many people know the word of God? I mean, like, you know the word of God. Like, if I were to do it, you know, start doing some drills around the room tonight or this morning, you could rattle off your favorite Bible verse. You could rattle off, you know, some scriptures that go with things. Like my husband, we'll be talking about something, and I'll tell him sometimes, I'll be like, I don't need you to tell me the scripture. I know the word of God. I know what it says. You know, he's faithful and true. I know that it says that he's everlasting and everlasting. He won't leave me. He won't forsake me. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. You know, who, where does my help come from? My help comes from the Lord. You know, I can rattle off all the verses. I know the verses. I know the word of God. But there is a difference in just listening to the word of God, and the next part of this says, you must do what it says. I can rattle off the word all day long. I can sound religious. I can look great. But if I'm not doing what it says, what does it matter? What does it matter? It says, otherwise you're only fooling yourselves. 
I mean, I can stand up here and say all the great things all day long and make it sound good, and I can look like this holy, righteous person, and it says I'm only fooling myself. There's nothing real there. There's nothing to back it up if I'm not doing what it says. And that's the problem. We have the Word of God, and we've somehow gotten to the point in our lives where we've compromised so much that we're kind of like, it's a guideline. God didn't really mean it when he said that. Yes, he did. Yes, he did. You know, when they come back and say, well, that was misinterpreted, you know, I I don't care. You know, there are many interpretations of everything. I can say, hola, hello, bonjour. They all mean hello, right? The Word of God is the Word of God. There can be different translations. My translation today is NLT. Yours may be NIV. It may be New King James. It's the Word of God. Just because the, the wording has changed a little bit, that it makes it easier to understand or fit, it's still the Word of God. It hasn't changed. It says, for if you listen to the Word and you don't obey, it's like glancing at your face in the mirror. You see yourself and you walk away and you forget what you look like. How many people ever do that? Like, okay, just for example, maybe Brittany can tell me or back me up on this, but like you get a new haircut, you see yourself in the mirror and you're like, yeah, that's good. And then later you see yourself in the mirror again, you're like, whoa, it takes you a minute to even recognize yourself, right? Tabitha changed her hair a while back too, you know? I know all these women changed their hair. Warren changed his hair a little bit, yeah. So um, it says that I had to throw a guy in there. He's the only guy I know that's changed his hair recently. So, you know, all the rest of them, they had it shaved off in my youth group. So, you know. It says, it is like glancing at yourself in a mirror. You forget what you look like. It says, but if you look carefully into the perfect law that sets you free, and you do what it says, and you don't forget what you heard, it says, then God will bless you for doing it, right? But there was more than one thing there, right? It wasn't just spouting it off. It was doing what it says and not forgetting what you've heard. Amen? I don't think that there was anywhere in that sentence that it said, and you can also compromise a little bit. Amen? So here is the next part. We're going to get down to the nitty-gritty where the rubber hits the road. It says, if you claim to be religious, but you don't control your tongue, you are fooling yourself, and your religion is worthless. Can we pull up my little kitty cat meme? (laughs) I love y'all's reaction because let me tell you what. I even have it written down here. The first time I saw this, oh, I laughed. I laughed just like you laughed right now. I laughed. I was like, oh, God, that's, a good, mm, that's good. Like, mm, I, I was ready. I mean, like, oh, we'll splash that all over the place. Let's put that bum by a billboard. I'm going to put that on a billboard. And then the Holy Spirit was like, what are you laughing at? And I was like, I'm not a gossip, God. What are you talking about? He's like, how many times have you entertained gossip? How many times have you heard stuff that said and you didn't shut it down? How many times have you maybe tried to do the right thing, but you didn't quite do it? And I was like, you know, like that, defa- that deflated balloon. It's like, That's how I felt. It says, if you claim to be religious, but you can't control your tongue, if you don't control your tongue, you're fooling yourself, and your religion is worthless. If you're praying in tongues, but you're also gossiping in English... What is coming out of you? You're a shifting shadow. You're like that unsteady sea. How can we believe anything that comes out of your mouth? How can anybody believe what comes out of our mouths if this is what they see? If they hear me saying that I was praying in tongues on church on Sunday, but I'm at the the office gossiping on Monday, what did I just do? It says, pure and genuine religion in the sight of God the Father means caring for orphans and widows in their distress and refusing to let the world corrupt you. So verse 26, when it says that our boy James had this correct, he already had, did you know that he already had this as a meme way back in the day? In James chapter 3 and 10, it says, out of the same mouth come praise and cursing, blessing and cursings. He said, my brothers and sisters, this shouldn't be so. How is it that we pray one day, but then we entertain gossip the next day? How is it that we, you know, speak blessings over someone, but then we turn around and curse the next person? How is it that we are shifting? back and forth. We can't do it. It says, out of the same mouth comes blessings and cursings. Miss Suzanne Schreier, she shared a story with me last year. She, she sells real estate out in Cumberland Cove. And she said there was one day when she was out there and she was with the, some people and she said she, was, she works with different real estate agents and builders and contractors and different things. And she said, you know, this person talks about that person. This person talks about that person. She said the Holy Spirit spoke to her and said, if they talk, to the, talk about those people to you, they talk about you to them. 
So don't think that if you stand here that you're better or above, they're going to talk about you the same exact way. And Holy Spirit was giving her a warning to keep that, control that tongue, to not give in to that, to not compromise, to not back down. And it's hard because sometimes we want to be those people that are in the know, don't we? We want to know the stuff. We want to know it before everybody else knows it. Let me tell you what, half the time it's not even worth knowing, even if you know it a few hours or a few days or a few weeks before. Do you know what the, you know what the big thing you get out of that is when somebody does finally come? Oh, yeah, I need that. You're just making yourself sound important. What, is, what does it matter? I tell you what, at my office, I work in an office. I have my own office. Um, and I have this policy, and everybody in the office knows it. They can come into my office, and they can talk to me. They can come in there and vent. They can come in there and cry. They'll come in there, and I'll pray for them, whatever they want to do. But they do know this. They can come in there, and whatever they say will never leave that office. Now, unless I thought it was absolutely detrimental to them in some way. But even recently, there was a, an older woman. She came in there. She was really upset about something. She kind of rant, you know, ranted and raved, and as we say. And, and I listened to her, um, you know, and I didn't agree. I just, uh, you know, sometimes people, you know, they just want to say something. I just let her say what she wanted to say. And, and I just, um, I, I didn't agree or disagree. I didn't speak about the person or the situation or anything. I just let her say what she said. And I just said, well, I want you to know that I love you. I'm praying for you. You know, you're going to have to make this right. Because that's what the Bible says, that we are supposed to point the people back into the direction to make it right with that person before they drag other people into it. And, um... Like, a week later, she came back to me, and she was like, you know what? I just wanted to come and say thank you. And I was like, for what? She was like, well, I came in here, and I said all that stuff. And she goes, and you never repeated it. I never heard it back from anybody else in the office. I never, after I said it, she goes, that night I went home, and I was just, like, torn up. My stomach was in knots because I thought, oh, no, you know, I could get in big trouble. I shouldn't have said that, I blah, blah, blah. And I said, well, first of all, you learned a lesson. You know, you learned that sometimes we can rant and rave. It's got to be in a safe place. And I said, I'm glad that you feel like I'm a safe place. But also we have to learn to control our tongues. She goes, I know. I know. I'm old enough to know. She says, but I just want to tell you thank you, she said, for your integrity. It's not compromising. I didn't engage in her gossip. I didn't put down the person or whatever the situation was. I just listened. I showed her love. I pointed her back in the right direction, and I kept my mouth shut. That's what I have to do because I can't pray in tongues and gossip in English and think that I'm going to make any change in my office or anywhere else in the world. Amen? So, our loyalty. Verse 27 says that pure and genuine religion in the sight of God the Father means caring for orphans and widows in their distress and refusing to let the world corrupt you. Refuse. What does the word refuse mean? It means if I refuse something, I'm adamant about it, right? If you, if you try to give me, you know, decaffeinated coffee, I'm going to refuse. You're a man, you coming on to me, I'm going to refuse. You're going to know that I'm going to refuse. You try to push me to do something I don't want to do, I refuse. Does refuse sound like it's eh, kind of, maybe I will? No, I refuse. It says we have to refuse to let the world corrupt us. Can you put up my next little meme, my little leadership quote there? This one, it says, just because a leader doesn't post all their thoughts on a current issue on Instagram doesn't mean that they are not thinking about the issues at hand. Perhaps some of us are trying not to add to the noise and are actually making a difference through prayer. Remember at the beginning when I said I just really wanted to rant and rave sometimes and God was like, mm-mm, because your mouth's reckless and you're already on, your life support's already on chill. Mm -mm. You pray in tongues, you can't gossip in English. You got to learn to keep your mouth shut. You got to learn to not add to the noise and make a difference through prayer. This is the thing, church, that I want to talk about today. When somebody comes to you and they are saying something about somebody else, don't add to the noise. Shut it down. This is the other thing. If somebody came to me and said something to me about Miss Nancy, I'll use her as an example, and they said something to me, my first thing would be, you know what, you need to go back and you need to talk to Miss Nancy because from what I know of Miss Nancy and her character, that's nothing like her. I'm not going to engage in your gossip. You need to go back and make it right with her because I know that person. I know their character. We need to start shutting it down, not adding to the noise, but we also need to not have divided loyalty. I don't need to hear what's being said and like, well, you know what? Sometimes maybe Nancy can be that. No, 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 no. No, 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 no. That's, that's not what we do. No. I know who Miss Nancy is. I know what she stands for. I know what she represents. Maybe that really did happen, but maybe she's just having a really bad day. Maybe you came across in the wrong way. I don't know the whole situation. You do and she does. You go back to her and you make it right. Because I know her character. I know her integrity. See, we have to shut it down 
but we have to also not add to the noise. If we're going to engage in the gossip with the same mouth that prays in tongues, what are we? We're nothing. We're fooling ourselves. We shouldn't expect to receive anything from God. It says our loyalty is divided. We have to shut it down. We have to remain steadfast and we have to remain loyal. It's the same way with God. When people come to us, you know, and, you know, people will. They'll come to you with every issue and problem, and they speak against God. Well, you know what we have to do? You're going to have to make this right with God. And I'm not saying that in a way that we are being religious or, you know, just trying to put off their problems. But a lot of problems that we have nowadays are just simply from lack of faith and unbelief that we've allowed into our lives. We have to shut it down. We have to remain steadfast. We have to remain loyal. So I'm going to finish up with this. Where do we go from here? Where do we go from here? We're going to go to Galatians. That's where we're going to go from here. So go to Galatians chapter 6. I'm going to wrap this up. I've tried to keep it fun and entertaining for you. Galatians chapter 6 says this. Let's get over here to Galatians. I like the Galatians. I almost started to say, I know when I say Galatians chapter 6, you guys start thinking of the armor of God, and then instantly I was like, wait a minute, that's Ephesians. (laughs) I'm getting my cities mixed up here. Galatians chapter 6 says this. Chapter 6 says, it's titled, We Harvest What We Plant, or it may say we reap what we sow. But verse 6 says this, Dear brothers and sisters, if another believer is overcome by sin, you who are godly should gently and humbly, gently and humbly, Help that person back onto the right path. Just like I mentioned earlier. We shut it down. We stand up for integrity. We stand up for the character of one another. It says, and be careful not to fall into the same temptation yourself. Share each other's burdens. Boy, that's a big one, isn't it? Why do we want to share somebody else's burdens? I got enough burdens of my own. I got enough issues and problems. I don't need somebody else's. But the Bible says that we are to share in one of those burdens. It says, and in this way, you obey the law of Christ. It says, if you, this next verse, I love this next verse. It's probably one of my favorites in the Bible. It says, if you think you're too important to help someone else, you're only fooling yourself. You are not that important. I mean, it's just straightforward. You are not that important. I'm like, okay, thanks, God. Got a little LOL after that one because I just love it. We're not that important. We are all the same in the body of Christ. Amen. It says, pay careful attention to your own work, for then you will get the satisfaction of a job well done, and you won't need to compare yourself to anyone else. Comparison. I hate comparison. Comparison is the thief of joy. Comparison is the thief of joy. Every time we compare, we diminish. Every time we compare, we've allowed the enemy to take and steal something from us. Every time we compare, we're losing something. Comparison is that thief of joy. And it says that when we are doing what God's called us to do, when we're doing the job well, when we are controlling that reckless mouth and we are not divided loyalty, when we are not compromising, then it says we don't need to compare ourselves to anyone else. It says for we are each responsible for our own conduct. Nobody likes that one, do they? You mean I have to be responsible for the things that I say? Really? So if I'm out here and I just want to, you know, trash Cody, I have to be responsible for it later? I mean, like, I just want to talk about him. I don't know why I have to be responsible for what I say. We have to be responsible for our own conduct. And so often we don't. This is what happens when those situations come around. Somebody comes around, they're like, hey, I heard that you said this about me. And blah, blah. Oh, no, 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 I didn't say that. So-and-so said that. I mean, I, just, I was just telling you, what, I was just repeating what they said. It wasn't me. Yeah, it was you. You repeated what they said. It's the same thing. You now made their gossip your gossip. You now made their words your words. You were just as reckless as they were. Now you have to be responsible for it. It says, those who are taught the word of God. Now, this is one I love, guys. Listen, it says, those who are taught the word of God should provide for their teachers, sharing all good things with them. I accept all gifts, cash, card, credit, anything you want to. I have a Venmo account. Hit me up. Verse 7, don't be misled. Sounds familiar, doesn't it? James said it back there in chapter 1, verse 16. Don't be misled, meaning that we can be what? Misled, deceived. If we had it all perfect and all right, We wouldn't be given warnings of not being misled. It says, you cannot mock the justice of God. You will always harvest what you plant, or you will reap what you sow. Amen? This is the way it goes, guys. If I'm reaping gossip, I'm going to get gossiped about. If I'm reaping a bad attitude, I'm going to get a bad attitude back. If I'm reaping in anger, I'm going to, or if I'm sowing in anger, I'm going to reap back. I said it backwards. But whatever I'm putting out there is what I'm going to get back. 
If I'm putting on a smile to somebody, I'm probably going to get a smile back. If I'm sowing good something, good provisions, you know, a blessing into somebody's life, God's going to bless me back. We will reap what we sow. We will get a harvest in due time. It says, those who live to only satisfy their own sinful nature will harvest decay and death from that sinful nature. Decay and death. Think about this. How many farmers do we have in here? I know we have some people that are farmers. You, you do farming. Having a farm and a garden is not easy. It takes worse work. From the time that you put the seed in the ground, if you want to see it come to a harvest, you have to work. You have to tend to it. You have to take care of it. It isn't easy. But could you imagine looking out over your garden? Now, this is me. I look out over my life as a garden. What am I reaping and what am I sowing? Am I seeing the good things come back? Am I seeing blessings over here? Am I seeing goodness over here? Am I seeing people giving over there? Am I, you know, what am I seeing? Or am I looking out and all I see is a land full of decay? Think about that. If you were a farmer and you go out and your crop is completely destroyed, how would you feel when you've worked hard? You know, David, if you work hard on that farm and you go out and everything's just, it says, death and decay. You'd be devastated, right? I don't want to stand before God one day, and I want to look at what I've harvested. You know, when God says, "Let's let's see what let's see what you planted. Let's see what you what let's see what your harvest looks like." I don't want to look out and it's mismatch here and there, this or that or whatever. I don't want to look out and see missed opportunities, and I definitely don't want to look out and just see this land of decay and death because I couldn't do the simple things like not compromising. It says. But those who live to please the Spirit will harvest everlasting life from the Spirit. Everlasting life. Isn't that what we're all in this game for? We want to make it to the end, right? We want to fight the good fight, run the good race. We want to make it to the end, right? That everlasting life thing sounds pretty good. Correct? I mean, think about it, guys. You've got everlasting life with the Lord Jesus Christ, or you've got an everlasting life in a lake of hell. Which would you rather have? You can compromise. It says, so let's not get tired of doing what's good. Can we put up my last little meme? Says, I'm doing good. Thanks for asking. <laughs> what good are you doing? He's <laughs> like, what do you mean, what good am I doing? This is what we hear so many times. Oh, I'm good. I'm doing good. I'm doing good things. Well, what are you actually doing? Like, we can speak a lot of things. We can talk a lot of talk. You know what they always say is your talk, you know, the talk that you talk matching the walk that you walk. What good are you doing? Because it says at just the right time, we reap a harvest of blessing if we don't give up. It says, therefore, whenever we have the opportunity, we should do good to everyone. Okay, so what is good? Anybody have any idea on what good is? Let me give you some examples of good. Good is discipling. Good is leading others to salvation. Good is sowing into somebody else's life. You know they have a need. If you're able to do something for them, you bring them food, you give them money, you do something, you're sowing good. Good is sending a text message and checking on somebody. Good is sending a little note saying, hey, I'm just thinking about you. You know, good is, you know, quality time. It's all of those good things. It says, if we do not grow tired, is everybody tired? I mean, I don't know anybody that's not tired. We're all tired, right? We're tired of life. We're tired of having aches and pains. We're tired of dealing with our family. We're tired of dealing with our jobs. We're tired of dealing with that boss. I'm tired of dealing with that pastor. I'm tired of dealing with that church. We're all going to be tired. But as Brother Ralph said today, we are overcomers by the blood of the Lamb and the word of our testimony. So what is your testimony going to speak about you? It can either speak that you're tired or it can speak that you're going to do what's good. Because it says at just the right time, we will reap a harvest of blessing if we don't give up. And this last part I'm going to go through, um, I'm going to have Miss Nancy come forward. It says, therefore, whenever we have the opportunity, we should do good to everyone. To who? Everyone. Who? Everyone. everyone. Even the crabby person at Walmart, we're going to do good to them. I hate Walmart. I can't hardly stand going there. Everybody's miserable at Walmart. It takes every ounce of Christianity and faith and everything else I have to go to Walmart and not walk out being the same way. But we're going to go and we're going to be good. We're going to show good to them. We're going to show good to that person that cut us off in the car on the street that almost ran us into the ditch. We're not going to give them any little hand signals or anything like that. We're going to pray for them in the name of Jesus, right? We're going to do good. We're going to do good to those coworkers who are the ones always back in the kitchen murmuring and gossiping and complaining. We're going to do good, right? We're going to be the good because if we don't start each day with the mentality that I am going to go out and I'm going to be the good in the world today, what is your world? Your world is where you're at every day. Your world is where you're at every day, the people and the things that you come into contact. So if you say, I'm going to go out and be the good, I'm going to cause the good, I'm going to be the good, I'm going to see it happen. That has to be our choice. But the last part of that says this. It says, we have every opportunity we should do good to everyone, but it says, especially 
especially to those in the family of faith. Who is the family of faith? The body of Christ. That's us. That's each and every one. It says especially to one another. We should be especially good to one another, defending one another, standing up for one another, being the difference for one another. Because when we come in here and we're filled up and our cups are overflowing, then that moves us outside of these four walls. And when we leave here today and we go to the Cracker Barrel, then our cup's overflowing, that good's going to overflow into the Cracker Barrel or into the Ruby Tuesday or into the Walmart because the good is going to go forth. But we have to decide, church, that we are a church not of divided loyalty, that we are one body in Christ, that we have to shut down the noise, that we have to stop praying in tongues and gossiping in English. It has to stop. Pastor Chris and I went through some stuff last year, and it was so horrible, and, and, the, and the noise would never stop. And regardless of how many times that we tried to handle it and do it in the right way, there was just more and more noise added to it. And the enemy will use that. He will completely use that because then all those thoughts are in your mind and it just, it brings you down and it's how the enemy does, just creating noise constantly, constantly, constantly. Because when all that noise is there, you know what? Then, then you have a hard time hearing from God. You have a hard time being in the Word because you're, you're just consumed with this noise and it's not how it's supposed to be. We have to decide that we are going to be the good, but we have to be especially good. And that's not saying that I'm better to you than I am to the person out there, but you are my body. You are my family. It says we are the family of faith. You are my family. And as my family, I should want to look out for you. I should want to speak up for you. I should want to stand up for you. I should want to believe the best about you. When I hear something, my first, my first response shouldn't believe, well, maybe that is about, no, no, no. My first response should be, what is the best about that person? What do I know about that person? How can I shut this down? How can I not add to the noise? We have to be the ones that make a difference. And so this is how I want to end this today. Twofold. I'm going to get our members of our prayer team. Who do we have on our prayer team here today? If you're on our prayer team, I'm going to ask you to come up here. There's twofold that I want to cover today. Who else do I have that's on the prayer team? Pam, can I get you to come up? Ron, can you come up? Alex is back there. Alex, will you come up? Be on the prayer team. Miss Julie, will you come up? So this is how I want to end this today. It's twofold. We, we are the body of Christ. We are the family of faith. But we all make mistakes. We hurt one another. We hurt other people. Right? And this is what I want to do today at the end of this service. I know that if you stop right now, if you were just to take a moment, if there are people in here who have been hurt. You've been hurt by other people. You've been hurt by people in the church. You've been hurt by people in your family. You've been hurt by coworkers. You've been the product or the, the you know, person that was gossiped or you know, slandered or something was said about. You've been hurt in some way. And this is the thing. When you do not deal with that, when you, every time you see that person, you think about what they said to you, what they did to you, it causes a seed of bitterness and resentfulness in your heart. And when that seed takes root, God can't do anything else. God can't work when there's bitterness and resentfulness there. It causes a seed of offense. And offense is the bait of Satan, and God cannot move and work in that. And so if that's you, I'm going to ask you to come forward in a moment. And I want you to allow these people to pray with you and just to lay that down and to forgive that person. And if you need to go back and make something right or even need to go back and say, you know what, you may not have realized it, but you hurt me when this happened. When this happened, I was hurt and it caused a seed of hurt in my heart. And I've carried it around and I didn't even realize I carried it around, but it's, it's not allowing me to let God do what he needs to do in my life and I need to lay it down. And the second part of this that I want to say is if you've been one of those people that your loyalty has been divided and you know that it has been or you've allowed some type of compromise into your life, whether it has to be with things that you've said, things that you've watched, things that you've read. But if you've allowed compromise into your life, if you've been one of those people who was adding to the noise, and you're like, today you realize Holy Spirit's shown you, you know, hey, I was adding to that noise. I, I thought I was doing good by sharing stuff, or I thought I was doing good by helping let somebody know what was going on, but I realize now that I was just playing into the enemy's hand. And I'm gonna ask you to come today and just to repent and say, God, use me to be the good. Use me to be the good. Use me to be the person that shuts down the noise. The, call, the person that calls forth character and integrity in other people. Help me to be that difference today. 
So they're going to play this song, and I'm going to ask you right now to not hesitate, because believe me, church, I know looking around here that we're all not all just sitting here perfect, not dealing with some hurts and pains of things that have happened that people have said and done to us in our lives. But if that's you today, I'm just going to ask you, can you guys drop the lights back there a little bit? We're just going to create an atmosphere of intimacy. I feel like when we're like this, people feel a little bit more comfortable about coming forward. But I'm going to ask you today to just come forward. Don't hesitate. We just want you to come forward. And I'm going to say a prayer. And if you, I'm going to dismiss you. But if you want that release, if you want to let go of those hurts and pains that you've had in your life from people, from words, we're all struggling. But this is the thing. God says, you know, that I'm here. He says, I have come to make everything new and perfect in your life. He says, I've come. I can help you overcome anything. And that's where we are today. So I'm going to pray, and while I'm praying, feel free to be dismissed. But if you want prayer, I ask you not to hesitate to come forward today and to receive prayer and to let those things go, to walk forward as a new person doing good. Amen? So Heavenly Father, I just thank you, Lord, for your word today, Lord God, that we are not a people of divided loyalty, Lord Jesus, that we are steadfast and strong, Lord Jesus, that we are true, Lord God, that we are fighting the good fight, we are running the good race, Lord Jesus, that our goal is to listen to your word and to not just know it, Lord God, but to do it, to not just hear it, Lord, but to speak it, to be adamant, Lord God, and refusing to allow the world to corrupt us. I thank you today, Heavenly Father, that you're touching and stirring hearts, that there are some hurts and pains there that need to be let go, that there are some people, Lord God, who are struggling, that need to quiet things down, Lord God, who need to stop adding to the noise. I just thank you, Lord, that you're calling them forth right now, Jesus. We thank you, Lord, for your word. We thank you, Jesus, for the sacrifice that you made, for you are true and you are mighty. You are the Lord our God, King of the universe. We give you all thanks, all honor, all glory and praise today. I pray a blessing over each and one that's here, that you can stay in worship. You can feel free to be dismissed, but I pray a prayer blessing over you, that you go forth this week and that you would be the good in the name of Jesus.